me share my screen. All right, Prof, can you see the screen? Yeah, yes, I can. Perfect, thank you very much. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. So by now, hopefully you've gone through some of the, the work that we've given you so far to prepare. Hopefully you've taken a look at your homework. Hopefully you've, you've understood what we've said up until now and that you've gone back and watched some of the recordings if you've gotten stuck anywhere. So I'm going to be quite short this morning before I hand over to Prof Kutia. All that I do really just want to do is uh, give you a sense of where you should be at the moment. And then uh, we can talk about the homework and then I'll give over to, to Prof Kutia. So in essence, by now, um, the kind of way that we're looking at the attendance for the classes that you're attending, especially from a virtual perspective, is that you should be logging into Teams with your student number. So the student number at Northwest University at ac.za, that is essentially um, the account that you should be using to sign in so that we can actually just pull you through from the class register. We have all of your information. It's a lot easier that way rather than us having to go look up um, who you are. Apart from that, please take a look at Ifundi. Make sure that you're part of the LinkedIn group. Make sure that um, you've submitted the Microsoft form. Uh, there is a link that we've provided in last week's slides that you can go through. If you haven't done the module preparation Microsoft form yet, please complete it and send it through. We're using that to populate your portfolio of evidence. So please, if you want your, your portfolio of evidence to have as much detail as possible, please, please fill those out properly. Then by now you should have submitted last week's homework also through the form, also um, attached on last week's slides. Then by now you should have made some progress on your project one. So you should have taken a look at the different project briefs that have been exposed on Ifundi for you. Um, also understanding what project one entails. Hopefully you've gone through what the training is that you need to complete as well from a, a, a Git, Agile and Scrum perspective. Um, also, please just make sure that you look at your, your referencing for project one, make sure that you keep your reference list handy. We're going to be expecting references in Harvard style, so please make sure that you put those in your readme file and submit those through with your project one. Then Prof Kutsia put a um, YouTube on, uh, sorry, a, a GitHub video on YouTube where she went through a detailed explanation of, you know, how you can actually interact with, with GitHub. So please go check that out. Um, it is also a link to the channel that uh, Prof has created. So you can actually see the videos that we're posting up there as well. And if you get stuck, you can at least go see what, what has happened there. Also very important to note that there will be no project deadline extensions this year for any other projects. So please make sure that you, you build your, your project one properly, that you're taking into account all of the planning that you need to do, everything that you need to do to, to complete the project, because your planning is essentially going to be critical for making sure you meet your deadlines. All right, then just a recap on the homework. So uh, please make sure that your, your repositories are on GitHub and that you've submitted your repositories through the Microsoft form. That should have been done before class today. If you didn't get to do it before class today, please make sure you upload it so we can still see what's happening. Um, if your repository is private, please make sure that you add us as contributors. You'll see that our links are, our um, tags are in the, the project one document. Uh, so please just make sure that you share it with us so we can actually see what you're doing. All right, are there any questions on that so far? Anything that you guys want to ask from last week? Just want to open up the chat quickly. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Prof, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, then we can go from there. I see that uh, as, there's question, as, as questions pop up into the chat, I'll address them. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I'm just going to share my screen. Let me just quickly find it. Yeah, Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. Right, that's fine. Right, everybody. Um, good morning. Um, so what I'm going to be doing with you tomorrow this morning is an introduction to APIs. So APIs is basically project two. 
Um, you are um, currently still busy with project one, and we don't really expect of you to actually, um, you know, be doing much uh, practically on project two yet. It's just that we want you to get your thoughts going and, um, you know, just exposing you to some of the concepts and the ideas. So that's what this is all about. Basically, what I'm going to do with you today is I'm going to, you know, be looking at what is an API and why is it so important for us to know about APIs? You know, the world is it's actually really revolving around APIs today. You know, we cannot, I think today, if you don't know what an API is and you can't use it, you really are not going to get very far. You know, just about all the large um, platforms that we are using, like Amazon and the web, any web services platform, and most companies and organizations, even like GitHub, are all exposing their software via APIs. And, um, you know, so we really have to understand how it works. And for next year, if you're going to go into industry, it's one of the skills that I think really will make such a difference to your whole, um, you know, uh, skill set that you currently have. And so what we are going to be doing in Project 2 is not really such a, in the, in the end, it is not very difficult, but it's just very new for many of you. So many of you may not have much of a background in it. Um, so therefore, what I want to do today is I want to give you a bit of a background on, on exactly what, you know, if we just know the tools and we drag and drop, we don't really understand the sort of plumbing behind the scenes. Um, you know, sometimes it will catch up with you. So if you just go and sit down with a tool and you start doing some dragging and dropping and setting up some configurations, you'll get it right. But I want you to understand, you know, that's my purpose today, is what exactly is happening in the background and where did this come from? Right, so basically our project two is all about, uh, it's called, if you read project two's brief, you'll see it's all about a, a company called Echo Power Logistics Management System. And so what this system is all about, it's just giving you sort of a nice sort of, you know, idea of a real company. So you should see yourself, I'm an intern working in this company, and I'm going to be learning a lot while I'm here. Um, and so we are going to be giving you some tasks to do from project two to project five, all based on this one scenario. Um, and basically, this company is a company that really benefits. It's a logistic company, you know, and logistics is where we actually sort of have a, let's say, a global network of, of, uh, of uh, sites where we want to send our projects to and our, our products. And or even South Africa, you know, you want to send now, Sonar is such a big thing now, you want to send your product across the country in a very efficient way. You want to track where the products are going and so forth. You know, so you really have to have a system that is very flexible and scalable. And basically what we need now is should be on the cloud. And it's something that, you know, needs to be implemented with the latest technologies. It's something that we want to have that is very sort of, um, you know, um, well, I want to call, call it loose, loosely coupled systems that we can chop and change and we can easily adapt as our requirements, um, you know, change. And that's for that reason, you know, what we are going to be doing with APIs in the cloud is probably the best solution that we can have for this type of system. So basically what we, what we expect of you is, is actually to build an API for the system, but we are not going to expect of you to do this large, big API. We are just choosing a small component of, of what we want you to actually be doing. So what we want to mainly do, um, do in, in this um, application in Project 2 is we are going to say, well, you know, the most important um, components of our system are products. So we are selling products uh, to customers. And how we do it is we, we let customers place orders and orders will then be for many products. So we have sort of an order details table. So we are not gonna go into more than that, but what we want to see is how you can now go and use the knowledge that you gain about APIs. We will be implementing this with a .NET, .NET Core 6, um, and we will be putting in a little bit of security and we are gonna be hosting this on the cloud. And we want you to understand all those principles that we are going to be doing there. Okay, so you want, we need you to implement a system like this. So basically we have a client. Now you know that the client, um, you know, if you think about the, the internet, the web, very often the client is uh, you sitting in front of a machine, um, you are at your browser on Google Chrome, and you are accessing something from the web. Now that's not the client that we are talking about here. In, in, in an API environment, a client is actually something that is uh, actual, 
um, you know, code that we write to actually access our API. So APIs, that's one thing you must always remember about APIs. It's an application programming interface. It means that it is a programming interface. It is exposed to programs, not to people, even though you may sometimes think you are accessing the API. It's not really true. It's only accessed via. Um, and so basically, what is the interface? The interface, you can see we have the API endpoints. You can see here we have entry in endpoints into our actual back end. So what is an API essentially? It's just sort of an interface. You know, it's not nothing more than this URL that you're looking at. That is what a, what a, let's say the interface of the API is. So API is for application programming interface. But behind the interface, we see some applications and some databases. So what you will be doing is you'll be creating a database with data in, and you will then be creating some functions that are going to access the data. So essentially what will happen is a call will be made to the API for, let's say, give me all the customers. So, so you will then send the call in, and now you have to understand what is this call made up of? What is the commands that I have to do? And how do I set up my endpoints so that I can actually um, get to the actual data that's in the database in the right way? And all that I want to do here is I want to just read it. I'm just doing a read. And, I, and as you know that we can read data, we can, you know, those are the normal SQL commands that you know. I can update, I can add new data, and I can delete data. That's essentially what we do on data. And your API must handle that. So most of what we are going to be doing will be that type of thing, you know, just going, accessing the data in the database. And in our instance, you know, the database is going to be sitting on the cloud. Um, we are going to have our API hosted on the cloud, and that will let anybody anywhere in the world access your um, API, and they will be able to write code to access your API, API in that way. So that's essentially what this project is all about. So for my purposes, I want to explain to you today exactly how this is going to work. OK, but you know what? Before you before I start on this, for me, it's very important that we understand where this comes from and what it really means in, in industry in terms of how the world has developed. Because sometimes, you know, you just look at this technology and you just use it and you have no idea where it came from. Why do we have it? What's important about it? And so on. So I want to show you this is how this is a timeline of where we are today. It's sort of, you know, it's not this thing is already a little bit older, but but you know, this is sort of the idea to see where we are. Now, most of you would know that we are working with REST um, interactions between a client and a server. And so, but let's just have a look and see how things developed. You know, so many years ago, there was a technology, you can see there it's the first one starts here in the 1980s. And I'm going to talk about that just now. But you know, in the 1980s, people started realizing we need to have computers talking to each other. This is essentially what we do. You know, we want we we need this. And so REST, you can see now, you can see it's already quite old. You know, if you look here. You know, I mean, it's 2000. It's very, I mean, it's much older than most of you. You you are all much um, younger than what REST is. Now, a lot of us think, wow, REST is so amazing, but it's actually a very old technology. And what's interesting about it, for those of you who may know, it's even older than what we call SOAP. SOAP is a technology that we have today as well, but it initially was the one that started the whole process. But today, we don't see much of it anymore. But yeah, what you can see, you must look at all the, you know, developments, these gRPC, GraphQL. That's, there are so many new things happening, but, you know, um, all of them can contribute to this environment. And it's a, this is a changing environment. It's changing all the time. And we have to keep abreast of what's happening. But OK, so what my story is, you know, many, many years ago, there were code written sitting on mainframes. And, you know, like, you know, so 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 you can think about, you know, we had so much sophisticated applications, but these applications were each on their own operating system and their own programming languages they were written in. In other words, you know, so if I, for example, had a function here that was written here and I said, let's say the number nine, I wanted it, you know, sent to somebody. This number nine was in a very proprietary format, some binary format. 
And any sort of code that sits on this machine cannot actually read it at all. And that was the problem we had. So this code was very safe. Nobody outside, if you weren't inside this environment, nobody could actually get to your code. And, and so this was obviously a very inflexible environment because we just couldn't communicate. And, and so the whole idea was how do we now get, you know, and I'm just going to be short about this. How do we get machines to talk to each other? That's something you must remember we are busy with. We are, we are here where machines are talking to machines. Okay, so basically from here, um, the, the, the origin of, of, of interacting, and this is the basis of our modern environments, is something called remote procedure called RPC, which I'm sure you've come across in some of your other subjects. And so basically, you know, what we need is we need a way of one function calling another function that's sitting on an, in another space with a different, you know, so, so it's a different pr process with a different address space. And, and you know, if you now have to code that, if you have to go as a software developer and you have to write the code to actually, uh, you know, call uh, another method sitting on another machine in another address space, going through all the network protocols and all those things, it'll take you ages. So what we need is we need a way of taking those complicated details away from you as a software developer so that you know, um, it's you are free to do what you're supposed to be doing. And this is where RPC started. And so together with RPC, um, one of the big things was how do I get, um, and this all has to do with serialization, how do I get one computer to be able to understand what is going on on another computer that's sitting in a different operating system, a different programming language? So that was one of the big questions that we sat with, you know. But in the meantime, we had the whole thing about client-server developing. So now we know, okay, well, I can have a client and a server. I have a request-response interaction. And, um, you know, the whole thing, you know, it was part of the whole development of client-server. Together with this was the actual start of something called XML. So XML all of a sudden gave us, it's a text format, and you have specifications that define the languages. And all of a sudden, it's like we all of a sudden found a language that could let machines talk to each other. So XML was a big move in this direction of getting machines to talk to each other. And quite interestingly enough, the, the, the company was driving this was actually Microsoft. You know, you would never think that Microsoft drove this. But the reason for that was, you know, that um, Java was the, was the other environment, the other platform in competition, you know, it was Sun Microsystems and companies like that. But you know what they were doing is they were, they were saying, our code can run on any operating system. And that's what they were driving. And so Microsoft got very afraid of this story. So what did they do? They said, well, let's do something to counter this. Let's create XML. Or they drove that whole process. XML was actually created by many different companies. But now machines could start talk to machines because of a language that all of a sudden could be defined that everybody could understand. So that was a big drive. And then, I'll, you know, we have Tim Berners-Lee, and he then created something called the World Wide Web, which was like a massive, you know, it's, I would also think this is one of the wonders of the world. You know, it was running over TCP IP, which today is still the same, you know, even from the 80s. And they started initially just to start interacting and sharing documents, never understanding where this thing is going to be going. And one of the beauty, I think this is a beautiful example of how a simple protocol can change something. And you must always remember in, in our world, when something is simple, it will change. You can use it all over the place. And, and HTTP, what he defined, is one of those things. So basically, he developed three technologies. First of all, the whole concept that, and this is very important, that everything has a unique address. If you have in the whole world, every single little thing that can be accessed with an, its own address, then you can communicate and you can exchange and so on. And so he called this thing, the user, it was called the URI, the Universal Resource Identifier. But we very often, we talk about the URL, which is the location. The one is the identifier, the other one is the location. 
Then he defined HTML, which is our markup language, which we view pages with, and he defined HTTP, which is the protocol that we have to know. So, you know, so when they started with this whole concept, it was about a browser and a, and a, a web server and a web browser that are communicating. And so it is something that, you know, uh, for the, the HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol, uh, we have something called resources, like files that we exchange, and they could be anything. They could be media, they could be query results, they could be movies, they could just be just about anything. If you think about chat GTP, that's, uh, you know, chat GTP, if you interact with it in a programmatic way through an API, whatever is on the other side is called a resource, and we can interact with it. And I mean, it could be many different things. And like I said, it's running over TCP IP, and we have an HTTP client and an HTTP server on each side. Okay, so this is essentially what it looks like. So one of the important, now you have to understand, you know, how a server works. So when I call, for example, the Northwest University server, the Northwest University server has got a lot of files that I need to access. Let's say your student record. So your student record will be sitting somewhere and there will be some application code that will be written that can access it, process it and display it. But what we need on the web server is something called the HTTP server. And this HTTP server has been written to understand a protocol, which is HTTP, which is a very basic protocol. And so what it knows is it actually sits and waits. A rumor server sits and waits, and it sits and waits on port 80. Generally, always port 80, but it can you can change the port if you want to, but generally it's a standard way. So we know that all requests will come to the to the to the actual HTTP server. So if I'm sitting here as a student on the browser and I say, please give me my student record, what I what will happen is an HTTP request, a specific one, will be sent. And it will be sent to actual, this is a, the address. Okay, the address is actually on port 80. Um, it will be Northwest University. So we combine those two things. But then I also have to find out which file do I want. So you have to have, you have to know three things when you make a request. Which is the what is the port? If it changes, you need to know that. What is the address of where the server sits? And now you have to also know what file or resource, we call them resources, is it that I want to access? So, so when this process happens, and obviously on your browser, you have to also, your browser needs to understand HTTP as well. So always remember that when there's a protocol involved, both sides have to understand that. Okay, so now um, we have our, our whole interaction and then we will send back a result and your browser understands how to present it. It understands HTML. It will then, and, and now we also have to know, so, you know, how did this thing happen? Did it go through successfully or not? Was there a problem on the server? Was the file not there? You know, so, so your browser has to understand now how to interpret the re response and how to actually react on that. So that's essentially what we see in HTTP. Okay, so when I make a request, this is how the request will look like. And I'm sure that you've seen this before, but it's for us and for our purposes for REST um, services, very important to understand it. So basically, one of the main ones we do is GET. So what does GET mean? GET means I send a request to the server and I say, give me some file. It's all that it is. Give me, the, give me a file, give me a file. Okay, so what happens, for example, in this one, you can see, at the top there, it says get. Okay, so I want to get. I want to get some. Now this is what I want. Uh, a student, um, and I'm going to send parameters. I actually want this specific student. So that is what I want. And you can see that I'm supporting HTTP 1.1. We are still sitting on that one. And then there are some information sitting in the headers. Those are the HTTP headers. For example, if you are sending cookies up and down between the server and the client, the cookies will be there in the headers somewhere, and many other stuff will be in the headers. So basically, this is just giving, getting information. What will happen? The server will go and find that path. It will go and find it on the back end. It will do whatever it can, and it will then return the answer back to you in a format that you can then interpret and display to the user. 
So that's get. And then the second one is post. If you want to now do more, if you want to send parameters across, if you want to now log into a site with a username and password, or you want to send a recommendation, or you want to do something specific, now with post, we send information to the server. Now, many people don't understand the difference between these commands. You know, you have to, this is one of the essential things about doing REST properly, is to understand exactly what these commands mean. So POST means I'm sending information to the server and I'm expecting the server to execute something on the other side. So it is something that's different. And why is this important? You know, one of the important things I'm going to talk about it just now is about caching. You know, for us, the whole internet is actually a bit of a slow place. And what we have to do is we have to enhance the internet with many different, you know, ways. One of them is caching. You need to cache stuff so that things can happen faster. Now, you have to ask yourself, if I do a get or a post, which one can be cached? And if you cache it wrong, what's going to happen? Are people going to get wrong results? That's why it's so important to understand what, when you use a get or a post or a put or a delete, it's very important to know the difference and to use the verbs in the right way. Because depending on what you as a software developer do, the servers are going to re react on that. And if you use the commands wrong, then your code is going to potentially result in wrong results. So basically what we see here is we say, I'm going to post some student information. Or I want to actually, you can see that I'm logging in with my details and that will be executed. So those are the two main sort of commands for us, for our purposes that we normally would be using. Okay, so now I'm just going to briefly go over um, the four main ones I think that we would normally be using and how it would work. So basically, like I said, you know, um, we have a protocol between the client and the server that has been set and we have to follow that convention exactly and understand what is coming back and so forth. And many of this is sort of hidden again. When we are using a tool, sometimes these things are hidden. We don't see them. Um, it is handled for us, but we have to understand in the background what are the codes that are being used as responses. So here we see get. Okay, so get, like I've already explained to you, is like this. We say, I want to get an order one, two, three, four. Now, what does it mean? I know the order number. I want to just get that, and I know there is an order, so I know these things. I know there is such an endpoint, and the server is going to find it, and if it does, it, if it finds it, it will return 200, okay? And if you get 200, you know you are good. You can, and now the, the software is going to display to the user, okay, you've got your stuff. If it cannot find it, it will send a 404. I assume everybody's seen the 404 on the web, um, you know, so you know that, okay, 404 means it's not there. Or otherwise, if the server's got a problem, it will say there's a, some error inside. So as a software developer, what do you need to know? You need to know the format of the GET request, and you need to know what is the responses that you will get back. And based on those codes, what are you going to now do with the, with the result? So post, post in this case, we know that we want to now change something. So I'm going to post some stuff. And in this case, you can see that I'm changing, I'm sending some order details in there. And so um, on the Restbox um, server side, you'll see that something will be happening. So in this case, something is created, a new order is created. So I've created a new order. So I would get back 201 created. And now what we see is what's interesting about this is like getting, I'm getting back a location now to say, okay, you've created an order, here is your order. So that's sort of the, the result and showing a resource that is being created. If it for some reason cannot do it, you are doing something wrong, it will say bad request 400 or internal error. So now again, you know what to do. You can then continue with your develop, your, your uh, application flow, or you can, you know, redo the order or whatever it is that is needed to be done. Okay, now we get into updating. Updating is put. When we do an update, it means that there is already something sitting on the other side, and now I just want to change it. So that means you know the identifier. You know the identifier of, let's say, an order. So you say, well, I have placed my order just now, but now I want to change it. So this is where I use put. Okay, so let's say I want to change the quantity of something. 
Okay, so basically you're going to ask it. I want to I want to update something there, or and the result will then be yes, 200. Okay, or 204. There's it, it doesn't exist. There's uh, or there's no content to change. 404 is not found. 409 is a conflict, and these are the types of responses that we will get. So put means update. So just remember that post means create something new. Put means update. And then finally, delete is very straightforward. Delete, you have to know what you want to delete, and it will then say either there's nothing there, not found, method not allowed, and service not available, or something like that. So we need to understand exactly, you know, what is the request to be sent, in what format must it be. And now what I want to, you know, sort of each of these requests that I'm sending to the other side, you know, this is basically interacting with the server on the other side, and that is essentially my interface that I have to then as now if I'm sitting. So if you are the software developer sitting there, you must make sure that everybody sitting on the other side, they know and understand what is your addresses. So if they don't understand your addresses and what you require, then they cannot interact with you. So you have to be very explicit about it. So these are my uh, sort of, we call them endpoints. These are my endpoints, and this is what you can do on my site. Okay, so here's just a little um, nice little diagram that summarizes everything. These are then the main ones that, that we can see that we can use, and you can have a look at that again. And here's then the long list of, you know, um, there are many of these status codes, and you can uh, go and read up, you know, depending on your level of how much you're working with this type of thing, you can look at these, um, you know, ones, but you can see basically if they start with a two, generally everything that starts with a two is success. If it starts with a five, you know, um, it's basically something wrong on the server side. If it starts with a four, it's something wrong from the client side. If you know these things, then it just makes it so much better. So you can see, for example, 503 is service unavailable, but, but basically that is, you know, you get lots of jokes. There are lots of jokes on the internet on HTTP status codes that you can have a look at that sometimes are very amusing. Okay, now we need to talk about two different uh, terms. And, and these are very important terms for us to understand, you know, the whole thing about get and put and um, so on. So basically, we have the concept of safety. OK, so we so what we need to understand is that certain of these methods are safe and some are not safe. So you must know what does it mean if an HTTP method is safe? So basically what it, what it means is if something is safe, it means that it's not changing anything on the server. You know, so if you are not changing anything on the server, you're not doing anything there. So if you should send your command a hundred times in one day to the, you know, it will not change anything on the server and it will not affect anything or anybody. That means it's safe. You can do that as many times as you like and nothing will happen. And so because of this fact that you can send a command again and again and again and never change anything, um, you can actually be doing this all over the place, but we can now cache this. So, so, so to protect my server also from all this, I can cache this information, I can store it somewhere so that the cached version will be picked up and the server is not going to be made so busy, you know. So, so now it's a static type of information sometimes, you know, so you, you want to get something uh, let's say a web page has been cached, you will get, it will not change much, you know. So like if you think about the Northwest University website, certain parts of it doesn't ch ever change. So you can cache those parts. So yeah, so there's nothing that's going to happen. And we need to understand the whole concept of caching. And, um, you know, if, but the problem here is that, you know, if you cache something that changes, you know, how would you even know what version you are working with? If I change, um, you know, if I cache something and all of a sudden it changes in between, my cached version and my real version are out of sync with each other. So basically, what we say is that um, if something is safe, we can cache it. If it's not, you cannot cache it. Um, so certain things that like when you change something on the server, it's not cacheable. Then we have the, another uh, term that we have to understand that it's called end impotent. Now, for example, you know, 
if you look at a a is equal to four, that is something that will never change. A is four, you know. So so that's that's just an example of what I mean by that. But what it means is that an operation will produce the same results. Doesn't matter how many times you are going to do it. Okay, so you can do this ten thousand times. A will be four. If you say A is four, A is four, it will not change. There's nothing that will make it change. And again, this is an important fact when you want to build fault tolerant um, APIs like GET. You know, GET will always get the same result. It won't change. Put. So put means. What does put mean? It means I'm updating something. So let's say, for example, I want to update my name. To, to I've changed. I've got married. I want to change my surname to something new. You know, whether I do this once or twice or 10 times, it's not going to make a difference. I'm going to be changing my name in the same way. So I can send this thing 10 times, you know, and, and it will change my name exactly in the same way. Delete is the same. If I delete something, whether you delete it once or 10 times, you delete the same, let's say, an order. You are not deleting something else. It's just the same order all the time. So get um, is a safe method. You know, so I can cache it and it's impotent. I can do it a hundred times and nothing will change. Yeah, so we need to understand what is safe and what is impotent. Now, for example, uh, post. Post is not like that. So you must be careful with post. That's the thing that we need to understand. So when you send a post, you have to ask yourself, what am I doing here? You know, so when I'm posting, I must make sure I, you know, I know and I understand I'm sending information to the server. I'm expecting the server to do something each time and to change something like I'm changing my username and password. Right, so, so we just have to understand, you know, very clearly as software developers, what are the um, methods that we are using and in what way. So, you know, if you look at codes, if you're looking through the code and you see there's a get, there's a post, put and delete, look at the code and try to see that it has been used in the right way. Because in the past, we have found even places like Twitter that even, you know, even large companies like that used to not use these things in the right way. And we find this mistake a lot where developers are not using, they don't understand this, you know, and they, you must understand this very clearly that you will use these commands in the right way. Okay, so like I've already said, get it gets the resources state representation. It is safe. It is impotent. So that's a summary there. And here I'm just giving you a nice little summary for you to always reference. Post, you can see there, it creates a new thing. It's like a SQL insert. It's not impotent. It's not safe. Read, we've already, the get we've already talked about. Put is updating. It's impotent. You can do it many times. And it's like a SQL update and delete. It's also impotent. You can do it many times. OK. So basically, let's think about just a little example of, you know, how do we use this? And this is like a common example that all of you are exposed to. So let's say you're a student and you have a bursary and the Northwest University is actually managing your bursary. So basically, what we see is the Northwest University has got a web application and you sit at your computer, you log in, and your computer understands HTTP, you will log in, you will um, sign up, you will um, with from, from your browser. And just remember now, whenever you are logging in with your browser, accessing anything like Ifundi, I mean, today, you know, if you think about what we're not doing with our browsers, every single interaction you do with your browser has got HTTP behind it. It's they're all running on HTTP. So, you know, HTTP really is something that is like all over the place. We must understand, as software developers, really understand how it works. But your browser has been designed to run on HTTP and know how to work with that. And so you are accessing the, the university's um, applications, getting your results and your bursaries and getting money paid to you and whatever else. But this we call, now this specific interaction here is just a normal interaction I'm talking about. And this we call human to machine communication. And I'm going to extend this just now so that we can see where does REST now fit into something and how is it different. Okay, and then I just briefly want to mention SOAP. So, you know, in the 2000s, XML was started, and one of the first sort of web services that was sort of started and used was something called SOAP. So, SOAP is called Simple Object Access Protocol. 
Um, you know, it was also one of those that was driven together with XML by Microsoft as a as a as sort of a way of, uh, you know, interacting between different types of computers with different operating systems and so on. But as time passed, you know, SOAP is something that is a very, it became very heavy. That's the reason why. So, so that was sort of its downfall because it became, it's very, very sophisticated. So if you're actually into like very sensitive financial systems and you need encryption of messages and you need, um, you know, um, transaction processing and so forth, then SOAP is the way to go. But for most of the other stuff and the interactions that you want to keep lightweight, um, you know, especially between organizations, some you would also very often see inside a company, but rest is between companies, you would more see more of that. But yeah, I just want to mention it so that those of you that are going to just, you know, there will be some of you that are actually going to be working with so because it is something that is still being used every year and there. But yeah, so SOAP was the first one that really became popular. And at some point in time, everyone who was just using SOAP. And slowly but surely, REST started and crept um, into the scene. And as you can see, you know, from this diagram, now this is 2020, I couldn't get any later data on this, but you can see that SOAP is about 23% of the market. And then there are some other protocols that are getting more popular, but then REST is like 69% very proficient. So for, you know, if you're working in APIs, you will most probably be working, you know, with REST. And so you can see the API Twitter's API is called, you know, that number there, massive big number a day. And you know, you can see how, you know, I mean, if you think about ChatGDP, for example, how many of you are all using it all the time? And every call you make is an API call in REST that you are making to that um, engine. So yeah, the, across the world, you know, we are using it for just about everything from our phones. You can actually, yeah, that's the other thing about it. Any device, you can use any device to actually call um, these things. So so yeah, these are just um, te this technology is really something that is something we 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 really uh, rely on um, as uh, software developers. And like you know, for so. SOAP has got a very sophisticated sort of, I'm just showing you this architecture. This is the WCF architecture that SOAP works from. That is also, it's also part of the tool that you are going to be using. But you can see, I mean, it's got layers of stuff. You know, you can, for example, set up uh, different types of contracts. Your runtime, you can do throttling, you can do errors, you can do, you know, message inspections, change parameters, you have security, you have so many encoding things and yeah, so I mean, it's a massive environment and it's very, I mean, really well developed, but it's just too top heavy. And um, like I say, it's common in corporate data exchange where you want like security, you want encryption, then you are going to be using it because the security of, of SOAP is really good, whereas the security of REST is uh, quite lacking in terms of what, what SOAP has. Okay. So, you know, when SOAP started and the World Web started, you know, um, and this is where REST now comes from, um, you know, people just started to realize that things are not too great. And then there was a guy called Roy Fielding, and he was also part actually of the group that wrote the HTTP specification, so he knew it really well. But, you know, he started looking at the way in which HTTP was used, you know, the get and the post and so, and, and how it was done. And then he said, well, and he, do, he did his PhD on this. It's, you know, one of those PhDs that changed the world. And he said, you know, let me just look at this again and see if, if there's not a better way of doing things than what we are doing with the client and the browser. Because most of what was happening then was client to browser. And people did not really think more than that, you know, so they thought, well, if I interact with the HTTP server, I must have a browser. Otherwise, I can't do that interaction. So that's what he sort of thought about, you know. And then he said, well, I, I through his PhD, and this is what we are using. So if you want to go and you can find his PhD, you can read it. So then he just took whatever was on the web. He didn't make anything new. He just didn't, you know, he didn't actually go and say, let me create something new. He used what was there, but he now viewed it in a different way. And so basically he said that um, he generalized the web's architectural principles and represented them as an, 
framework of constraints or an architectural style. So REST, this is something you must remember now. REST is a style. There is no, it's not a new specification. It's not a, you know, you won't find, um, you know, okay, here's the REST. It's not like that. It's just a way of using HTTP in a different way. And so this is the way REST, so many of you probably have no idea what REST stands for, but this architectural style is now referenced as a representational state transfer, which is an interesting name. I mean, representational state transfer, what on earth does that mean? And how you know, do we get to that? So basically what it means is that every resource has got a representation. So for example, if you want to think about your student results, your student results can be an HTML file. That is a representation. But if I should wish to do it, I can put your student results in a PDF, or I can put it in an XML or a JSON file, or I can put it in a video. You know, in other words, every resource has got a representation that I can then expose. And then it's the, it's the whole thing about state transfer. So every interaction, as I interact, you know, we, you know, you talk about state machines. So when we do an interaction between clients and servers, there is a change in state. So when I make a call to a, a server, I ask for something, this, there's a change in state that happens there. And that is why we call it state transfer. So that is where he thought about this whole interaction in this way. It's almost a, a state machine. And as we move from point to point, you know, we 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 um, go further and further, find more information. You can imagine, you know, when you are browsing the internet, you sit and you search something. You say, well, let me find something on this topic. You click on a link, you go and you find something, or you read it. You click on another link, and then you continue to the next page, and you're going up and down all the time. You know, so that is what we as people do. But have you ever thought about this? What if you can write an application? that can behave like you in the background. So, you know, this is actually how REST, this is the ultimate REST, if I have to say it like this. So the code will access an endpoint, which is a link. The endpoint was going to return a result plus another link, like it would for a person. And then the code will see, oh, here's another link. And it will go and it will use this link as an endpoint to another place. And in other words, if, if we had to uh, let our code, you know, this is and this is why we call, you know, the, the Internet is actually an application platform, not just a platform where we can as people be interacting with web pages, but it's actually a place where if you could write code in this way, I mean, this is a very difficult way of writing code. You can actually have an application calling another one and then calling another one in the end, not really knowing where it is going, but getting to some place like you as a person would if you're browsing. But those things are very difficult to implement because we don't have the clients and the, it doesn't work yet. But there are people doing this sort of thing. We call it HATIOS, but I'm not going to talk about that much, but that is exactly what's happening. Okay. So like I say, it is a design pattern on how the web should work. It is not a standard, and it is saying that the web is actually an application platform. And these were his constraints. I'm just showing it to you. I'm not expecting of you to, you know, just know about it. But basically, it, it is a, there is a uniform interface. In other words, your interface that you are using for your endpoints are always in the same way. It is stateless. It means that between the client and the server, there should not be anything like a shopping chart, for example, is something that is stateful. The client and the server have an interaction. The server must remember what is in the shopping chart, you know, so that's a stateful interaction. Whereas now we say no, REST must be stateless. You must send from the client to the server everything that is required to make a request without, you know, but this is statelessness is not easy. It must be cacheable. It is a client server architecture. It's layered and there is code on demand. In other words, if you want to quickly download something, you know, you can get it when you need it. So those are the constraints that he then decided on. OK, um, and then finally. This has been something, you know, this is this is what we have to understand very well is our interface. So this is sort of, you know, what all URLs look like, you know, so I think everybody has seen these, this before. So 
you know, it's a foundational concept to understand as a as a risk developer. Um, the whole thing about resources and identifiers. So basically, the thing that was defined is something called a URI. A URI is a uniform resource identifier. This is a string of characters that identify a particular resource. And then we have something called the URN. Now, a URN is like an ISBN number of a book. You know, it is a unique number, but if I say to you, here is this number for a book, will you know where to get it? Does it actually show a location? It doesn't really show location. Whereas a URL is a specific location. If I give you a URL, you will find it. You will get to it on the internet. So therefore, a URN is the name of something and a URL is a location. But now if we look at our, our URL, well, what we are looking at there is a URL. You'll see what we always basically have is we have our, you know, it, we see, okay, this is HTTP. It's a S means secure link. And then what we see is, first of all, our authority. In other words, this is the um, server that I'm talking to. On the internet, this server um, or host has got a very specific name, DNS servers, know where to find it. And it has a, I'm running here on the port, which is one to three. You can specify the port if it's different to 80. If you don't specify anything there, you know that it will be port 80. And now we have to specify the path of the file that is going to be sitting on that server. So you can see there is a path forum questions. Then I'm going to specify what is what is that I want, and then some fragments. So this is essentially what we use when we define an API interface. Our API interface must look something like this, and we call this basically an endpoint. Okay, so another, um, I'm just briefly explaining this here. Um, I'm sure you may have seen this before, but when you are working with REST, our results normally return in the format of JSON. So JSON is JavaScript object notation, um, and, and basically what it looks like, it's so, you know, before people used to return stuff in XML, but XML is quite verbose, you know, it's quite heavy. So JSON is a much more lightweight way of doing this type of interaction, and JSON is today the one that we use the most. And what you can see, it is a um, name value pair. So what we see here is I have a, a structure, a document. It's all about employees, and I see name value pairs. I see names, first name and last name. So what we see here is this is what this thing is about, and this is the value. So these are name value pairs. Um, and if you can look at this, this curly brackets, it has to be like that. And then you can see there are those brackets. And yeah, so that's the format of uh, a few. Here we are returning three employees. Um, and that, that's the format of the JSON. Okay. So essentially, when I'm looking at um, a REST API, what is it that is involved? So when I'm making an access, so basically I have a client making an access to the server. And what do you see here? Basically, I know I have to know what command to send. I have to know what is the address. But the combination of this is an endpoint. That is my endpoint that I set up, and that will access something sitting over there. And then some code will run on the server, and what will be returned? I will return JSON to the client, and the client can read it, and the client can now go and do something with that. And so we have the concepts of resources and then of URIs. I've already mentioned that, and those are very important for our um, what we need to be able to do. Okay, so here's an example. You know, so you are going to be using um, this type of, um, this is a Swagger um, interface. So when you are running your code, this is the result that you basically would be seeing. And um, so yeah, here we have an example of a few commands that are all about a person. So you can see the first one is post persons. And then that basically is a creating a new person in the database. Get, um, get with no parameter means give me all of the people on the other side. It's a whole list that you'll get back. Get persons, and then we see this curly brackets username means give me a certain person with that username put means update a certain person in the database and then delete 
update a certain person deleting. Yeah, so basically what, what we have, these, thing, these basically are the endpoints that are defined that we will, there is one resource called person. So the resource is persons. Um, in other words, um, it is, um, you, could, you can also get this stuff in different ways, like it could be an HTML file you're returning or a JSON file or whatever it is, you specify that. But basically, this is the endpoint, and you have to know and understand as a software developer how to define your endpoints in the right way. And they are very flexible, but you know, you can see it's a very standard way of doing things. Um, and you know, you have a pause that you have to specify here. Okay, so let's go back now to the example that I showed you initially. Um, now, so we want to understand, you know, so what is the difference between, and this is what I'm trying to show here, is what is the difference between actually um, exposing um, in the normal way, uh, you know, HTTP with the clients and browser like we as people would do. And this is now basically the first part that I showed you. How does a human talk to a machine? You know, um, and that's when you sit in front of the browser with your, URL, you type in nw.ac.za, you get an answer, and now you are you are interacting. So in other words, you as a person, you are invoking these things, and you are interacting. But let's now say, what is then the power of REST? So what will REST now help us with? So let's assume that there are, what we want to say is, you get a bursary as a student, and part of what we want you to do as a student is we want you to buy textbooks from your bursary. But so what students would do, you know, and you all know that's true, that's what they do. They will go and they will take the money and they will use it for other stuff instead of textbooks, which is not optimal. So what we say is now we want to improve our bursary system so that we actually force you as a student to, when you get your money, you will buy textbooks with it. You won't just take it and do whatever you like with it because we want you to be successful. So let's say there are many bookshops out there, and these bookshops all then um, they all then sell these textbooks, all at different prices. You know, so so obviously you want to get the book at the best possible price. So what we now say is we there is somebody that thought about this. There is some third party, and they thought about this problem and said, you know what, I'm going to create a, a bookshop centralization service where I will be able to link up to all the academic bookshops in the country, and I will then give you, whoever you are, the option of choosing the best book, placing an order, and you will then get the book. So basically what's happened here is that this is a service that is being created, and this service is now going to call, you can see it's calling each of the bookshops by its endpoints, and so let's say you are searching for a book on C Sharp. It will then say, well, let me do a search over here, over here, and over here. I'm going to return a whole list of books with all with different prices. So this is the function of this bookshop's uh, service. So this is the service that now sits on the internet, and now it will actually, and you, you know, Northwest University, and Cape Town and all the other universities, they can all use this bookshop service. So this bookshop service may be making a bit of money out of this by just putting on some, you know, um, you know, a little bit of profit on, on what they are doing, and that is how they will be making money. So if you think about, you know, we have 50,000 students and they all use this, so there's a lot of students that are buying books. Um, and so, and the thing about this is we now can see, you know, if you have a student, are you buying your books that you should be buying? We can get better pricing. And, and so this becomes a really nice environment. And so what happens is the Northeast University then decides, okay, I want to integrate this thing with my bursary system where I'm going to let students now. So what essentially will happen is I as a student, I'm an IT student, what I now can also do is I can make sure that my IT student does not buy books that's not IT. Because, you know, if you're studying IT, you should only be buying IT books. So, so I can now ensure that when I will control via the browser, that when you put in your degree, then I will make sure that you are only really searching for books on your topic. So you will be saying, okay, please give me all the books that are on C Sharp. Then I'm going to call and make a call to the service to say, well, for this specific student, student A, 
give me all the books and then calls will be made in the back end to the other bookshops on that side. All these calls will be made. And then so, you know, um, I will get the best prices and everything will return back. So now what I want you to note here is I'm now building a really nice, sophisticated application from many companies. And what is the one constraint is that all these company systems must be able to talk to each other and interact. And yeah, so I mean, the, the whole thing about this will be where does the money go and how are things paid and how, how is delivery made and so on. But this is essentially what REST does for us. It gives us as developers the ability, you know, because, you know, as the Northwest University, for example, our core business is not selling books. We, we are not interested in that. We want to have our students buy the right books, but that's not something we can control. So there's other people that do this as a business, you know. So what we say is, well, let me take your sort of um, expertise that you have, and I want to put that as a component into my system. So this Bookshop Central becomes a part of our systems because we make a call to you and we will then get from you your service that you are providing. And because we are all talking REST, we are all talking the same language over HTTP, we can now build a, a quite a large system using all these other people. And if, for example, Bookshop A goes out of business and there's another bookshop that comes in, it's fine. You know, it, the, it, it, these things can now happen very quickly without much effort uh, because of the way in which we are using these protocols. It's not proprietary. You know, many years ago, these things were very sort of brittle and difficult to manage. But because we are using sort of this uh, standard way of interacting, it becomes much easier. Yeah, so for me, this was just sort of an idea of, um, you know, how this thing works. Um, and so what I now want to do is um, I want us to now, I'm just going to put this down. I just want us to now um, go to, right. Yeah, the first thing I just want to quickly show you is can you see my Visual Studio? Yes, we can. Yeah. OK, so the first thing I just want to do now is, you know, I'm, I just want to expose you a little bit to, um, OK, I'll look at questions this now, but I just want to expose you a little bit to, um, you know, what, and I'm going to ask you to do something small um, for next week uh, practically so that when we do next week's lecture, you will have a better understanding of what's going on. So what we are going to be using as our tool is Visual Studio, best to get this version uh, 2022, and I'm just going to create a new project, okay? So what we do is when we um, create our project, we just want to create the basic ASP.NET Core Web API. Um, and so we are not doing this one. This one we'll do later, which is the web app, okay? So we are just building an API, not, not a whole uh, web app. So we say next, okay, and then you can give it a name, something like that. Um, and then I'm going to say next. And so I'm just really illustrating something small to you here today. So we are using, if you look at this option here, we are using, um, you know, .NET 6. You can see .NET 3.1, and we actually used that one last year, but it's now out of support. This one is out of support and we are using long term support. It's very important to use the right version um, that is sort of stable and there's a lot of documentation about it. We are not going to later we'll be doing authentication, but for now I'm not doing authentication. Um, we can configure for HTTPS and for now um, I'm going to say for this version, I'm not going to enable open API support. I want you to see the difference between the two. OK. So now it's going to create the project. OK. And so then this is what it basically created for us. So um, you can see that it's created my solution and um, all that I want you to have a quick look at. Now, this is sort of the default application. You know, you always get the default application that just does something small for you to look at. 
But what I want you to note is that there is something called a controller. Um, we'll talk about that next time. And we see that there is something, there's a class for weather forecast. Um, and this is all that this little program does. Um, you know, there is, let me just get to the controller. So what does is, what is this controller do? So next time I'll talk about what controllers are today. I just want to quickly show you. So what is this thing to do? You can see it says the, there is API controller and there is a class with a forecast controller. And then there are some static, uh, you know, you can see it's freezing. Now this is the weather forecast. Just remember we are not connected to a database. It's just a little static program that we are looking at here. And so what do we see now? Here is a HTTP command, HTTP get. So we know that we are working with a get. And so what's happening here is that there is some random um, generation of, you know, um, you can see here that there is just random generation of, of, uh, of this information. And then also the actual here, you can see the whether it's chilly or freezing or so on. So it's just like in the code, some generation of something that's happening. And I'm now going to run it by clicking. You can see there is test demo. I'm going to run this. OK, now I just have to find my browser. OK, and here's my browser where it's, where it's executed. So what do I see? What's happened is, you know, so you run it and what is happened now, it is going to show it to me on the browser result. And just remember the result that is now being shown is not like the normal browser that you would expect, a nice pretty browser that's meant for people. The, inter the what I'm looking at now is I'm looking at what is meant for um, software developers to use in their code. So you can see what I'm running here on localhost. Localhost is always the host that you know is available on my um, local machine. If you are using the cloud, it will be different. And you can see that there is a port 7202, and I'm running on this file here with a forecast. And what I see here is I now see my weather forecast. You can see that is the today's date, the temp. These are all just you know randomly generated. It's chilly, it's sweltering. It's no, okay. So if I if I now inter, you know do this again, if I interact again, you can see that it I think it should be changing. You know, it's changing randomly all the time. So if I should now look at the raw data, that is the actual JSON information that is being returned. So, so what I'm looking at is this little program that I've now, you know, uh, created on my machine um, here, um, you know, has now been executed by some endpoint, which I've just looked at, and it's now running this code because it's being called using the get function, um, and it's generating something randomly there for me. So, you know, if you are now going to, so this is basically, you could imagine like a little API sitting on the internet and you know, okay, well, we are just doing it locally now. So that's the main difference is we are locally looking at it. Um, you know, and okay, these are like the headers that you see. So you can see there is the response header that we see um, and, um, you know, all the different, there's the local host, um, and some of the information that we see there. Right, so um, that is when I now know now when you, so, so if you, for example, write an API, this is one way of testing it. You can test it like this, but the difficulty here is it's difficult now to invoke. Now, let's say you've got parameters you want to send to it and you want to do different things with it. It's actually difficult to invoke it, you know, um, and to do new things with it um, and, and, and you know, because you know, have to, if you want to add parameters, you'll have to type them in there and so forth. So what they've given us is an option to, and I just want to show, illustrate this today, they provided us with an option of actually, um, you know, doing this in a different way. So I'm going to close the solution and I'm going to make a new one. So I'm going to say, just to show the difference, I'm going to create a new web API. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'll just leave that name there. And this time around, I'm going to enable open API support. Later on, I'll explain to you what it exactly is. But so it's been built into the tool. It really makes it so easy to work with. It's really, you know, the tooling is really amazing and really makes your life so much easier. 
but you must understand, for me, it's very important to understand what's running in the background. OK, and so the same thing happens. We have exactly all the same stuff sitting over here. And there's again my controller, and this is where the code, you know, the controllers are where the actual methods are sitting. And so I'm going to run this again. Okay, and so now the result looks very different. So built into the, when you check the open API option, you'll see now all of a sudden something called Swagger will appear. And so this is an interface that has been created for us as developers. This is not for, you know, people looking at our applications, but now we can actually go and without, you know, wondering what's going on, we can see what's going on. So for example, there is Git. So we can see, okay, I'm now looking at the weather forecast um, endpoint here. You can see it's called Git weather forecast. That's my endpoint. I can open this up. And so what I now can see is you can look at it and you can see, um, okay, I can say try it out. And then there's an execute option. So when I run it, what you now clearly can see is you can clearly see, okay, this is your get command. That is your endpoint, okay? And what comes back is now my response. You can see what that is my response. And you can see those are my headers. And you can clearly see what's going on. And you can now also see your HTTP code, which is very nice. So there is 200 success. And um, yeah, if there are any schemas, you can see those. That's my schema that I'm looking at. So there's a lot of information that I now see. And this makes it so much easier. So when you are developed, and this is what we are going to be looking at, you know, for expecting of you in this um, project, we don't want to build a client. So we are not building a client. When you are executing your um, API, um, you know, we just want to see this interface. It's already built in last year. The students actually had to do it themselves, which was a bit more complicated. But yeah, you need to go and then just um, enable that option and then you'll see this. And from here, we can now see all our methods that we've implemented and it's so much easier then to use. Okay, so let me just go back to, I'm going to go to, and then something else I would like to show you is, you know, um, APIs out there, you know, APIs on the internet. So here is, for example, a tool called Postman. So um, if I look at Postman, let me just start over here. Okay, so when I'm looking at Postman, this is on the internet. You can see um, that here are um, popular APIs. So if you want to go and find out, okay, so what is out there? I want to build an application and my application must now interact with, you know, with new things. Um, so, you know, here's, for example, I'm just going to take the very first one. It's called Bold Sign. So, Bold Sign is an e signature software. And obviously, let's say it's not your job to do e signatures. It's not something that you want to go in, but your company wants to get people to, you know, use e signatures. So, here's something called Bold Sign. And so, what you now can do is you can now go and inspect the API. So, what do we see here? Here is, for example, you know, um, here, here we see for branding, you can post uh, to create a brand, to edit, and, you know, to get a list of all the brands and to delete a brand. So you can go and do some branding and you can see there is the delete and there is your uh, um, information. So here, everything on documents, you can see, I can send a document, I can get properties, I can do an audit trail. Lots of you know, so if you you want to learn about APIs and and what now these are these guys are using uh, very good uh, practices when they define their APIs because you can see there is your base uh, URL then it says versioning it uses it uses versioning and then it's got the path and it's got the option so you know if you want to make you know just learn more about APIs it's a good idea to get a Postman account for example there are many tools like this also out there. But yeah, to investigate here are teams. And now, now this is then, if I look at this whole, this is an API called Bold Sign, the Bold Sign API. And you can now see, now very important also for me is, you know, something that we look at here is um, this company, are they doing it in the right way? So they are exposing resources, branding, documents, plans, sender identity, teams, templates, and users, okay? They are using 
um, resources, there is not a verb there. There is not something like get branding or do this or, you know, process order. Those are not the right ways of actually creating API names. Your API name must be the name of a resource, okay, like branding. And your resource, you can see, it says, um, okay, here it says brand create. Okay, here we have brand create. Okay, um, now if you do a post, you don't actually have to call it brand create. You just post brand, um, you know, but to make it simpler, you can do that because it's by default. If you post brand, it's create. So to say post create, brand create, but it's just, you know, makes, I suppose, for those people using it, it makes it a little bit more straightforward. Yeah, so that's a way of looking at that. And now, for example, I've just got here um, another link to GitHub. Now, you are all using GitHub. You are using GitHub as a web um, application where you log in and you do your stuff. But um, here we see the API of GitHub. So I can I can call GitHub in an application and I can then use it in an... So let's say you want to build for your company uh, some enhancements over GitHub. You can then use these. Um, you can see here, for example, here is the um, API to manage the user and so forth. And you can also go and find this inside, you know, Postman to look at this in more detail. But if you just go and, you know, use that um, link there, this is actually where the full API has been described. And we call this the root API. So very often, very many organizations have the root API and the root API, if you've got, if you've got the root API, you will see all the different um, calls that and the, the endpoints. These are all the endpoints that one can use for this root API. Right, so then basically that is then all from my side. So let me just see uh, if there are any um, things in the chat that we can address. Or uh, yeah, Ms. Miller, is there anything you think you would like to add? Um, not really. So a lot of the questions in the chat have been around get and post um, and understanding when to use which one. So I'd suggest for those of you who are still not completely certain what the difference is, maybe go back and look at the slides um, maybe, you know, rewatch the recording. Um, and then the other question, which was a pretty good question, was the installation of Visual Studios to do some of the, the exercises. Um, so I see we might just need to put a guide together to, to explain what is needed there. But for okay. those of you who want to install Visual Studio, um, there are a lot of resources online that explain to you what you need. As long as you have web, web development enabled, you'll have access to .NET or .NET Core, whichever one you want to use. Um, we recommended that you use .NET 6. Please just take note that .NET 6 is different from .NET Core. Um, the last version of .NET Core was .NET Core 3.2, I think, um, which is fundamentally different from .NET, which has now become .NET 6, 7, and 8. Um, the way that they're compiled, the way that they run, the way that they execute is, is slightly different. So please just take note of, of which version you're using. It'll also impact um, your ease of use when you're spinning up an API, which is why we suggest it's uh, .NET 6. I've posted a link in the chat that explains the evolution of .NET if you're keen to go read up on some of that. But apart from that, with regards to normal APIs, I think, Rob Couture, you've covered everything. OK, thank you very much. I'm just waiting. I just lost my, my screen here because I just have a little exercise that I want you to do. Um, I'm just waiting for this thing. It's just taking a while. Yeah. But um, yeah, so basically what I want you to do is I want you to do a little exercise where you are going to take that same little um, example I showed you, the default example that we have available. So I want you to install the tool. And so um, we will put up a link for the submission. This is then basically assignment four. So um, what you must do is you must just run and execute that same little application. I've just shown you how to do it. But then what I want you to do is I want you to add without content, you know, there it comes. OK, so let's just go there. OK, so assignment four is basically create the default ASP.NET Core API like I've shown you, then modify it to include a post and a delete method. But no, you don't need to just empty methods. They don't have to have anything there. Just go and do it. And then upload a screenshot of your results. So you you run your browser, you, it will run and your browser will display, and your browser will display the swagger result. 
and then we can see, right, and then I want you to display the whole thing with your, you know, make sure you include your URL. And so all that I want you to do is, you know, take the link of assignment four and upload a screenshot of your results. And there is the link to that. Yeah, so that's just a little small. So next week we'll be talking about controllers and we'll be talking about how to, incre you know, how to add a database. So we'll be doing all that stuff because, you know, you hand in your uh, project next week, project one, and then you'll be ready to start with project two. And if you, and then an important thing I just want to mention here, you know, we give you these assignments and I'm giving you this assignment. It's a very small one. It will take you like half an hour. You know, um, just do it because it helps you in gaining a better understanding of what it's all about. So when we do the next lecture, you sort of, you know, if you struggle with installing it, if you struggle with this or that, now is the time to sort it out. It's not the time to sort out little issues before a week before the project has to be handed in. So, so we give you these assignments for a reason, just to help you to become more comfortable and to understand when we are talking about something, this is what it's about. Okay, and the other thing I did is I put in the chat, I put a little um, uh, for today, a little quiz. So if you just take from the chat, take the quiz, and then if you can go and then quickly fill that in. So that is just a little quiz to see whether you uh, listened this morning and whether you are here and uh, whether you are still alive and well in this class, because I'm sure, you know, not everybody is uh, always with me. Um, but yeah, so let's just see. Uh, that's all then from my side. Um, so is everybody happy then? Yeah, it, the, do the homework marks count as part of each project? No, not of the project. The, the homework marks count in the end towards your portfolio of evidence and your attendance. Doesn't count towards the project. Counts towards the final re review at the end of of the of the term. You know, we so we are we are you know we are giving you lots of small things to do: attendance, uh, quizzes, assignments. And everything that is submitted, like I'm giving you a link for submission. Last week you had three links for submission. Those things will not count much, but they do count. And it's for us to see how active are you in this class? Are you participating and are you with us? Okay, so somebody says that for the Kanban project, can we only create two free charts? No, so if I, I also have a free version and I can do three. I can do three free charts. And uh, the fourth one, I can't, can't. you know, the, the burn down chart, you have to find a way of doing it. So what I would, you know, what we say is, you know, go and investigate. What is a burn down chart? How do I do it? Look at your dates that we give you and your hours and all that uh, information. Make a burn down chart then in Excel, make up your own one and then perhaps put it in on the readme file. But you then can, uh, the burn down chart, unfortunately, is not available, but you must then generate it in some other way but we want a burn down chart from you. We want to see that you've done it and you understand the concepts behind a burn down chart. Okay, so there, um, yeah, there's the link for today's little quiz. You can quickly do that quiz. Right, anybody else with any questions? And I hope you enjoy it, you know, I think I personally love APIs. I love the whole architecture of this environment. It's such a dynamic change. And, you know, I've been involved in it for many years. And um, I just see how technology is changing and how things are getting more sort of, you know, um, you know, I mean, the tooling makes the thing, things a little bit too easy, I would say sometimes, and a little bit inflexible. But um, I think it's such an exciting place to be in. And if you, I would always say one day, if you go to find yourself a job, go and find a place where you can work with APIs and the cloud and all these things, because that's really where the action is. Um, combining with obviously intelligent techniques, um, um, but yeah, there's very interesting things out there if you and, and enjoy the project. I think it's such a nice project to do, and I hope that you know you'll get a lot of benefit out of it. Right, so I think that yeah, that's then all from us. So if there's nothing more from anybody, then we can then um, yeah in the meeting here. Right, everybody. So then I'll see you. Yeah, so somebody says I already created the API. Okay, that's great. What is I didn't know what you said. It has more it has more than required for assignment four. 
yeah, if you want to do it with all the methods, that's perfect. For me, it's just a, a question. Assignment four is just doing it. You know, whatever, you know, if you do more methods, it's fine. If you want to do it more advanced, you know, there's, I mean, I'm really giving you the really basic sort of exercise. Okay, everybody. So we'll see you then um, next week. Okay, if you're a part student and accept all student, we, uh, I think it, no, that would be fine. We are just checking per student whether you've done something or not. Okay. Right, everyone, have a good day, and um, I hope it's warm where you are. Bye-bye.